Our guests are um, Miss uh, Natalie Nugire. She's a um, uh, columnist and um, leader writer for Guardian now. Hello. <laughs> And um, before she was, a, she's an acclaimed um, a journalist. And with us is also Ralf Fuchs, uh, from the managing director of, from the Centrum Liberale Moderne, Center for Liberal Modernity. Hello. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Professor uh, Nina Witoszek from the University of Oslo. There's a Center for Development and Environment. Uh, um, Where's the professor? She, she, she's somewhere with us. And, and then Joanna Stolarek, um, the, the director of the Warsaw Bureau of Heinrich Böll Stiftung. And uh, Professor Sebastian Oberthur, uh, who is from GovTrans. This is a network uh, governing the EU's climate and um, energy transition in turbulent times. It's a long name, but it's uh, very telling. And last but not least, Tomasz Savchuk, who is here with me. Uh, in Warsaw, he's a member of um, Kultura Liberalna. I think we should try a little bit with theory and philosophy, what actually this green liberalism is. Uh, Professor uh, Timothy Garten Ash uh, has talked and discussed a little bit uh, about it. And uh, my uh, provocative question would it be if green liberalism is simply less liberalism? And um, maybe uh, Professor Nina Vitoshek, do, do you have any ideas what this green liberalism actually is? Um, is there any actual concept about it? And, and how much am I um, wrong when, when I say it's simply less liberalism? Uh, I think that actually I am not so much uh, interested in defining and reconceptualizing green in uh, liberalism. I don't know if you hear me. Can you yes, hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, what I do believe, and I am a staunch supporter of the idea of the Green Deal Europe, I do believe that this is the only utopia for realists, um, to use a very potent term by um, one of the, uh, my favorite writers, Bregman. Uh, it's the only uh, feasible utopia for realists uh, for today. Coming back to the definition, I think we should still need it. So maybe Tomasz Savchuk, what is this green liberalism? Okay, so I uh, have, Thank you very much and uh, good evening uh, to everyone from the Teatr Polski in Warsaw. Uh, well, I, let me mostly point out a, a conceptual problem that we might have in the present situation with regards to defining green liberalism because uh, it is, as you probably rightly uh, think, it is a bit oppositional to what we consider to be the kind of classical or mainstream understanding of liberal philosophy. And uh, let me begin here with a short reference. The, the American historian Frederick uh, Jackson Turner argued in the late 19th century that for many years the shape of American democracy has been influenced by the reality of a frontier. So he formulated this quite well-known frontier thesis. And he argued that since America always had enough free land uh, for everyone to settle down, all social conflict could in principle be resolved by further expansion to the West. So, uh, but by the end of the 19th century, uh, Turner observed, Americans had already reached the West Coast and the frontier was gone. So the event, as he put it, uh, has closed the first period of American history. And this indeed seemed like an important event. The famous uh, German philosopher Hegel also thought that the United States could develop a proper political life only after the frontier had closed, since in the new circumstances, Americans would have to turn uh, and face one another. Um, and my take out of this would be that a similar event seems to drive the contemporary ecological reality uh, on a global scale, wherein further extraction of limited natural resources um, cannot reconcile the conflicted human and non-human needs. So in this sense, what Turner and Hegel had observed was something like the natural limits of the concept of negative liberty, that is freedom from uh, external constraints. They found, so to say, non-negotiable uh, natural constraints of freedom. So I would say that the mainstream political philosophy as such 
has recently been influenced by two major events, uh, which, inspire, which, should, which should or might inspire two turns in our political thinking. Firstly, a social pragmatic turn and then an ecological turn. And by this mainstream liberal political thinking to which you might have uh, uh, referred earlier is what I usually call, uh, what is usually called liberal constitutionalism. That is an idea that the basic concern of liberal political order is to have the, to have the right legal framework. So the first event is, of course, the rise of the populist, nationalist or autocratic politics in the West, which has al already been mentioned, mentioned by previous speakers. And it shows that one can have actually a liberal uh, constitution, but this does not guarantee social and political stability. And then comes the second event, which is obviously the pandemic. And it shows that even if you have a legally and socially stable order, it can be ecologically unsustainable. So this means that the conditions of stability for a liberal democracy are even more basic, not just legal and social, but also ecological. Uh, the spread of the virus, you might say, the virus, well, the virus can network globally from mouth to mouth. It shows us how much the world is uh, interconnected and it shows us also how human and non-human actors shape the conditions of life on Earth and how, in this sense, politics relies on, on a material basis. So, uh, to sum up, I would say quite inconclusively, but this is probably uh, expected if you talk about philosophy, uh, political philosophy, uh, that these two turns have major consequences for liberal politics uh, and must influence concepts such as freedom, pluralism, uh, universalism or justice, and I have mentioned briefly some of the consequences with regard to the concept of freedom here. Uh, but it seems also that uh, we need to think through the consequences of these conceptual turns and this is a work that yet needs to be done, much of it yet needs to be done, and it seems like a great task for us to make uh, our thinking fully relevant for our turbulent times because many of these themes are not well um, written out in, in liberal theory for, uh, for us for now. Yeah, that, that would also be my um, provocative thesis, thesis that uh, from what you are saying, actually, uh, it means that liberalism is a little bit not ready uh, for uh, our times from the uh, climate. Well, no one is ready, I would say. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the climate crisis is especially urgent and we need to make decisions now. And um, from that perspective, the interesting question uh, for me from the liberal point of view would be if the European Green Deal, as we know it today, as it's being proposed, it, whether it's um, somehow threatening to a um, liberal, somebody who, who considers himself a liberal, one question. And on the other hand, it would be if it, is enough, and I, I was thinking that maybe Professor Sebastian Obertur, um, you somehow could uh, try to <laughs> uh, answer that. If, if, if an, any liberal should be th feel threatened by this um, project of European Green Deal, but on the other hand, if European Green Deal is enough, if, if we need, as Professor Timothy Garton Ash uh, said, uh, the, many people think that liberal democracy may not cope with this challenge. Um, yeah, perhaps a couple of words on the European Green Deal. Um, and I think uh, Timothy Garten, Garten Esch already pointed a little bit to the openness of the concept. Uh, I don't think any liberal should be frightened or so by the, by the European oh, Green Deal, but um, rather should see the, the opportunities, the potential that is in the European Green Deal to address some of the challenges that uh, were pointed out before. So there's the ecological and the climate challenge, obviously, of organizing the transition, but there's also a lot of uh, stuff in there that allows us to advance on inequality, solidarity, and also community building. But it's uh, important to understand perhaps that the European Green Deal as such is a policy program, it's a strategy, that will be developed over the coming years and that will uh, need to be filled with life in that process and will be further shaped. Um, so when it comes to the inequality, for example, we do have um, elements like the just transition mechanism that allows to 
uh, draw on resources that are being made available then, for example, for the regions that would be particularly affected, uh, the coal regions, etc., that would be especially also those regions that uh, Timothy Garten Ash mentioned, the, the, the ones that are easily left behind. Um, so that would help the countries to address inequalities in there. But the programs, how to do that, will need to be developed by the countries. They will not just fall down from, from the European level, um, which is perhaps the, the, the other element um, that uh, is, is to be emphasized in the European Green Deal. And that is also a lot of participation and the process that comes along with it, uh, with the European Green Deal. Um, there's something called the Climate Pact that would more reach out to the citizens and uh, to societal um, groups, etc. cetera, um, that is part of the European Green Deal. And all that is not yet very concrete on how that will be developed. Uh, and that's what I said at the beginning. It's an open concept that can be shaped. And I don't think one should be frightened, but one should engage uh, with it and, and try to shape it so that it is uh, capable of addressing inequalities, that the process, uh, which is kind of also created, um, is one that allows us to build community, uh, that allows for participation, for, yeah, um, for freedom of speech, and, and really bringing in all the interests of stakeholders that are needed in the process. Perhaps that's uh, enough as is a first it, answer it, to it, your question. It, do you think it's enough? Um taking into the consideration the scientific research, the what we know about not only climate, but also about the destruction of ecosystems. Is this um, strategy enough? <laughs> it, again, a little bit the same uh, answer. It can be enough, mm -hmm. uh, but it will depend on uh, how it's now filled with life. Proposals by the European Commission will come forward with respect to climate, but also, as you seem to a hint at uh, the loss of biodiversity, the protection of our ecosystems. Um, and, and these will be proposals also still by the Commission that will need to be negotiated uh, by the EU member states, that will need to be then implemented by the EU member states. And not only the member states, but then also cities, regions, uh, etc. Um, so that is a process that will need to advance and, and go forward and uh, needs to be shaped as such. If we look at the proposals out there, they go quite far. Climate neutrality 2050, an emission reduction of greenhouse gases by 55% by 2030. Some are saying we need even more, but if you look at it, it's, it's uh, quite significant, the steps that are being undertaken, depending on the details that will then be shaped in the legislative process. Um, so um, we can't be sure that it's enough, but uh, we need to understand this also as a program that's not just for today, tomorrow and the coming year, but for something that will need to build uh, in, um, in, in the future process that will need to develop over the next decade, where we will always need to go back and see, have we done enough or do we need to do more? So in that sense, it's also uh, really a long-term long project that uh, will shape, hopefully, also uh, decision-making in the medium and long-term. Thank you, uh, Professor. And um, I, I wanted to check up with uh, Ralph Fuchs if maybe we managed to overcome the technical problem. I switched to my smartphone. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, it's very good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Finally. Uh, yeah, so, so, so uh, now it's your chance to do the, the, uh, the, the remarks. It will not be introductory anymore, okay. but <laughs> you can comment on, on what, what has been so already said. And um, if I could also ask, what would you underline? I mean, which part of the strategies that are being discussed are interesting from a, for a liberal? Which methods, which instruments, and which you find even threatening from the liberal point of view? I will come back to the instrumental uh, the mm -hmm. question for the, on the means in a, in a second, but would like to start what I had immediately in mind to reflect a little bit on this really interesting term, green liberalism. Um, it's, it's still quite unusual and not at all self-explaining. For a lot of people, 
uh, involved in the green movement and particularly in green party politics, liberalism still is rather a foe than a friend. Something they associate with market radicalism, with deregulation, with social egoism and self-privileging of the privileged. And in fact, there is um, a deeply ambiguous relationship between the green movement and the liberal school of political thinking. And uh, it's, it's really an, an ambitious undertaking to figure out how can liberalism and environmental protection go together and what is the potential area of conflict between them? Of course, you can argue, and a lot of environmentalists uh, do, uh, that defending the, the stability of the global ecosystems is inherently a case um, of defending the freedom of future generations to live in an environmentally uh, safe conditions instead uh, of a kind of permanent environmental emergency which probably would lead into more authoritarian government, more nationalism and ongoing conflicts on natural resources and, mi and, and migration. And that's true. If, if uh, 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 climate change will spiral out of control, it probably uh, will lead into a kind of authoritarian uh, future. Uh, so what, what we should, should avoid both of, uh, because of humanitarian and political uh, reasons. But we should be aware that there is an immanent tension between environmentalism and liberalism, at least in three dimensions. If you're look, listening to Fridays for Future, uh, this, this really uh, wonderful movement of uh, young people putting the uh, environmental question and climate change at the very center of uh, the agenda of the, the next generation, um, one of their main uh, slogans is follow the science. What does, what does it mean uh, and, and what is the, the, um, uh, the, the consequence for the democratic process if you are giving science, exactly the most outspoken climate scientists, the highest authority and the final say about what has to be done? Then science trumps politics, parliaments, and governments have no other choice than to implement scientific findings. And this kind of environmental, there is no alternative shortcut, abolishes the very nature of democratic politics, which is essentially about deliberation and conflict on alternatives. Yeah? The second uh, uh, problematic uh, area is a way of thinking that the end justifies the means. Yeah, the end uh, to, to uh, then protect uh, then our environmental uh, um, life uh, ensuring systems um, is more important than the means. And if climate policy is about saving mankind from the biggest disaster ever, Every means seems to be justified. And if climate protection demands draconian restrictions of civil rights, then let's go for it. Even my, my, my good friend, Timothy Garden Ash, which I, who, whom I really admire, uh, he has been talking about the maybe necessary restriction of individual liberties uh, to, uh, to fight uh, climate change. And Third, the most fundamental root cause for the authoritarian temptation of uh, green politics lies in a, what I would call a Malthusian understanding of the environmental crisis as a result of too much of everything. Yeah? If you read the crisis of our natural ecosystem as a result of human overshoot, too much of production, too much of consumption and even too many human beings on earth, you almost unavoidably will end in a slippery slope towards authoritarian consequences. If protecting the earth system is about restricting our economic and social life, industrial production, private consumption, mobility, and if people are not willing to change their lifestyle voluntarily, then you need to implement a draconian system of control 
and command. So how to avoid the authoritarian trap without downplaying the urgency and the dramatic nature of the environmental crisis? What is the liberal alternative to this kind of ecology of restriction? Basically, this is my thesis, that's the ecology of innovation building on our ability to find creative solutions to uh, the environmental crisis. And the most urgent and most promising challenge for the next decades is to kickstart a green industrial revolution. This is about decoupling economic prosperity from environmental degradation, not only from CO2 emissions. This is decarbonization of the energy and, and transport system departing from fossil fuels towards renewables and a solar hydrogen economy, rebuilding our, our cities, re-engineering the, the chemical and the steel industries, a huge effort. But this is demanding not a slowdown, but an acceleration of innovation and investment. Yeah, it's not about going back, no, it's going about forward to a new um, the system of cooperation with nature instead of uh, increasing uh, economic wealth on the, exp on the, the, the um, expansion of nature. I would say the Green New Deal is a promising framework if we avoid to slip into a kind of green plant economy with tight regulation of everything by the state, but instead set free the creativity of markets of entrepreneurship and the competition on the best solutions. And if we rely on citizens' responsibility more than on state wisdom, this is not an, an, uh, an argument against regulation. This is an argument for smart regulations. For instance, um, uh, an, an improvement of the, the um, CO2 uh, emission trading uh, system giving natural consumption, giving emissions, giving pollution a price yeah, about uh, ecological reform of our tax system and creating incentives for producers, for, for, for entrepreneurs and for consumers uh, to change uh, their logic into, uh, I would say, in, uh, a sustainable uh, direction. Um, thank you very much because you, you, you've touched on two points of controversy, so it's very good for the discussion. Uh, uh, first is uh, what you underlined, uh, whether we can count on innovation and, and new technologies that uh, will uh, help us to combat the climate change and the ecosystem um, um, extension. Or, um, and the second one is whether we need more market methods to um, regulate how we manage uh, the uh, resources, whether the logic of markets is a, um, it, it's a good way, or as some critics would say, we already have too much uh, market um, logic already, and it has brought us to the point where we are. So I wanted to ask um, Joanna Stolarek, um, uh, do you think that um, this is a, a point of difference between the liberal and somebody who would describe himself maybe a leftist, um, that the liberal will, um, will be saying and defending the right, uh, the, the logic we've been um, living so far, so we can grow, we can produce more, we can have more, we just need to be more innovative, we need green industrial revolution. Tak, tak, mogę, mogę słyszeć i tak jak mamy wolność jednostki jaką wartością etarną dla świata demokracji, dlatego pozwolę sobie mówić po polsku. Freedom of the individual as an inherent part of democracy, so I will speak Polish, if you allow me. Biorąc pod uwagę Panie pytanie właśnie na temat, czy rynek już dość reguluje, czy mamy przeregulować. Ja myślę, że my potrzebujemy regulacji, potrzebujemy stabilne struktury stable structures in order to rise to the challenge that we're facing 
tym wszystkim. My też nie tylko potrzebujemy regulacji rynkowej, ale też potrzebujemy, ja wiem, że to nie, 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 niechętnie usłyszą liberałowie, ale my też potrzebujemy uh, państwa. But we also potrzebujemy need the state. Stabilnych... That's not something that liberals will be happy to hear, but we need the state authorities to act. Jako jednostki nie damy Because rady as individuals, tym, we will not be able to do it. Które oczekują nas związane z właśnie We will not be able to rise to the challenges that lie ahead. Challenges related to climate change. You also cannot forget that we are acting as a community. These are connected vessels, individuals, institutions, and our community. You can't. Uh, rise to the challenge in any other way. So, to ask an additional question, would you also assume that innovation and technology will allow us to live with, without self-restriction? Restriction of production, consumption, and limiting certain rights or behaviors in order to avoid a crisis. Or, as Ralph Fuchs says, it will not be necessary because what we need is new technology and innovation. And this will help us avoid self I think we should be talking about opportunities. It is an opportunity for new technologies, for innovation. New technologies and innovation will ensure a civilizational progress, but they will also protect us. I myślę, że to nie jest potrzebne, tylko musimy troszeczkę przedstawić się, przedstawić się we to need to zastanowić się, jak funkcjonują łańcuchy dostawcze, żeby, żeby móc zacząć właśnie zrobić coś nowego. Ale In to order to proces, be able to do something new, but it's a process, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, dlatego, um, dlatego ja myślę, że rezygnacja z pewnych rzeczy, oczywiście, że to jest um, powinniśmy, ale też um, well, we should give up on some practices, but as individuals we should also think about how we live. Every stone can cause an avalanche, uh, so we all need to do what has to be done. And the pandemic has uh, laid bare the fact that you don't have to overdo stuff. Sometimes a small meeting is as satisfying as a big party. These things have come to light and we are now considering them, thinking uh, about them. Of course, it would be better if we didn't have uh, COVID, but it's food for thought anyway. I don't know if uh, Professor Nina Vitoshek is still uh, with us. Have we overcome um, the technical problem. Professor uh, Vitoza, can you hear yes, me? Yes, yeah. Perfect. I think we've actually managed to pinpoint um, three important moments um, uh, uh, where, where the Liberals need to answer. Uh, and first is um, uh, uh, Ralph Fuchs mentioned that um, he, he believes that um, uh, new technologies and innovation uh, will um, help us uh, overcome the question of some restriction. Um, uh, of, of consum consumption or um, of any resources that if we innovate then we will find enough resources. Uh, I, I hope more or less I, I conveyed what he mentioned. And the second point is whether market methods, market logic is a um, good idea to manage the resources for example, as we do with energy in European Union. And the third is, uh, how much should we be underlying uh, our self-discipline as cons consumers, or how much is it the matter of system? Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, 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 ideas on, on that, and, and please add to that what you wanted to say earlier, and we were interrupted. Uh, fine. Uh, so. If we understand uh, innovation in the Schumpeterian sense uh, as a creative destruction, uh, then of course uh, 
this innovation can get out of hand and uh, what we need uh, is uh, both socially sustainable modernity and environmentally sustainable modernity and that's what we need to build you cannot just build environmentally sustainable modernity without increasing social inclusion and uh, reducing inequality i mean that's obvious so much is obvious so uh, innovation for its own sake won't solve the problems. Now, I live in Scandinavia, uh, which, as you know, is this little en enclave in Europe where people invest in the quality of life rather than in the, uh, the national growth uh, product. And even Norway now is uh, uh, investing much more in renewables and the losers on the stock market are actually stud oil companies, the Equinor companies, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, who are the winners? The winners is, uh, is for example, Quanta Fuel, which is the uh, representing the circular economy and uh, renewable uh, future. So uh, Norway, which is the most petrocolic country in Europe, is actually point to, to pointing to a trend. On the one hand, quality of life uh, as the major criterion of human and environmental happiness and justice. So quality of life both for the humans and for the environment. And secondly, uh, green transformation, which is uh, uh, you know, which is going under control, under control of the responsible governance. And that is very important. So what we need is actually to rethink governance and re-embedding capitalism, which, as we've heard before, uh, has got decoupled from social concerns too much. And the effect where the cascade of crisis, financial crisis and other crises in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter, as I, as I understand it, uh, what you're saying, it's a matter of priorities. So the first priority would be... It's a matter of balance, actually, balancing the socially, uh, social sustainability with the uh, environmental sustainability. It is a balance uh, between social justice and environmental justice. These two things should be absolutely going together. Before and they go together. As, yeah. Before liberty. Absolutely. In, Without losing liberty, even, I mean, if we go to Leonardo da Vinci, who was the first, uh, uh, if I may say so, uh, from my own studies, the first precursory environment, environmentalist in the Renaissance, he said, I am for freeing all the animals from their cages, but I'm also uh, thinking that the uh, the premise for freeing all these animals is human liberty, which we cannot lose either. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Professor Vitoshek. Maybe I could uh, come back to Professor um, Sebastian uh, Obertur, uh, because I, I think uh, you, you could um, comment on some of these um, controversial points um, as far as um, technology and innovation is concerned, and this um, uh, market logic is concerned, and individual choices as um, very important or even more important than this is, um, transformation of system. Is it, is, are these the um, points where liberals need to uh, ask themselves and under, answer the questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps uh, a, a few comments. Um, I am always a little bit astonished about these kind of principled debates um, about market, innovation, restrictions, regulation. It's, it's the combination of things, right? And if I look at how the debate has been going on climate protection, for example, over the past uh, years, then it's increasingly clear that climate is a cross-cutting issue and in different sectors and um, areas of, of uh, our societies, we will need different mixes of things. And just innovation and hoping for that will probably not always do the trick. Uh, we will probably need restrictions on car emissions, 
uh, and just looking uh, or, or just also the, the um, use of energy in cars. If we just move down the innovation path and say, okay, electrification of transport will do the trick. Well, we'll need lots and lots and lots and lots of windmills, which will also be ecologically, environmentally problematic. So we will probably in the next step uh, already now have to think about um, how to limit the energy use of cars, even if they are electrified, because otherwise we will need too many windmills. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's really innovation, yes, but we will also need regulation, call it restrictions, but regulation um, in, in various areas, including in buildings, etc., cetera, um, how, how they are supposed to be built, how much energy uh, can still be used in buildings, whether they should actually be net producers of um, energy. Um, so for, for, for me, it's always a mixture and you need to look in the different areas uh, where emissions need to be reduced. The same for biodiversity protection that will not just be um, that will not just be innovation, but will also have to restrict um, which areas can houses, streets, etc., be built on, and which ones need just to be protected, uh, which may be perceived as a restriction, but it's it's fundamental for any of the other freedoms. Um, that these areas get protected. Um, perhaps one final word then also on, on the youth role in the world and vis-a-vis -vis China that was mentioned. I'm also doing a little bit of research on that. Um, I think the challenge here is really to demonstrate and show that a liberal a democratic system can live up to the challenge and can um, really uh, show to the world, to China, etc., that um, the energy transition, the climate transition, the environmental transition can be brought about in a way uh, that protects civil liberties, that's, that is done in a democratic way with the participation of citizens, um, etc. So I think that that is probably the big challenge internationally to demonstrate that um, and still do that with many partners around the world together. Uh, we we have um, maybe I can check uh, still on Natalie uh, no Giret. Good evening, everybody, and, and it's a pleasure to be in this in this discussion. I'm not an expert on uh, green liberalism, so I come I come to the discussion uh, uh, with with my media hat on, and I'm rather aware of um, uh, some of the difficulties that um, we've had in the past in 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 covering these issues or in getting through to the people that often feel left behind on these issues. Um, I'm speaking to you from, from France and I remember, and this is a, 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 this is a comment I'm making somehow in reaction to, to some of um, Ralph Fuchs's great comments, which I learned a lot from. Uh, Ralph mentioned that it's one of the things he said was it's, you know, innovation and then getting uh, our tax system uh, in line with uh, priorities to do with climate and the environment. And this just brought to mind uh, what happened in, in my country, France, two, two years ago, which was that there was a, a tax was being introduced to limit uh, use of diesel fuel. And this actually triggered uh, uh, the yellow vest approach. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because um, polls, opinion polls show across our countries, even in Poland, by the way, that um, the, the Green Deal and issues to do with the ecological transition are widely accepted by people. When you ask them in opinion polls, they, they generally support the idea. Um, but when it comes to some of the concrete implementations of this, uh, that's when you hit, um, you hit a wall, you can, you can hit a wall. And I think the, the, um, the balance that was mentioned earlier is extremely important. Uh, and it doesn't just have to do with hitting the right notes in terms of finding the, the right equilibrium between social justice and uh, environmental friendliness. Um, it, it also has to do with the nature of the conversation we're having and even the tone of the conversation. Uh, we, we all live, I think, in countries where the tone of the public debate 
can be extreme can be quite extreme and um, and uh, coming from the media world and you as media users and readers you know how extreme new technologies can make this public debate and so i think the extra effort to be inclusive and to go and reach out to those who feel left behind and who are not part of us we are the urban a rather privileged uh, group, right? Uh, globalized in our outlook, uh, very Europeanized in our thinking. And I think it's going to be crucial if we want to reach this, uh, this shoot to the moon, you know, the, the Green Deal and Europe's objectives feel like what, what uh, John F. Kennedy said in 1962, he said, we want to, we choose to go to the moon. So Europe, the EU says, we choose to go to carbon neutrality, and, uh, and, and, the, and the full ecological transition. I have um, many questions from um, the viewers. Um, maybe I can start with this one. Uh, the question is whether the uh, climate crisis um, means, as some people on the left say, that we need to change the paradigm of um, uh, what it means, what development means. Uh, so is this is, I, I guess this is the question about post growth. Can we still have growth if we want to stop the uh, cri climate change, whether we need to discuss uh, the very capitalism itself? And I don't know, uh, maybe some of you, uh, I don't want to pinpoint, we don't have enough time for everybody to answer, unfortunately. So maybe somebody um, feels uh, he can answer that. Okay, so I'll try maybe, um, I guess I would go for, <laughs> I don't know, Professor Oberthur, do you think that, and, and then Ralph Fuchs, I guess. Uh, Professor, do you think that we need to discuss the capitalism? And as people on the left say, we need to discuss whether we can have growth and what does it mean to develop? Uh, and that's a long-standing debate, yes. right? Um, yes. And, um, I, I don't have the final answer for it. Um, I, I s simply think that, well, we probably need to redefine what we mean by growth. Um, but if the right restrictions are in place that I was talking about before, that we, we, we will need to restrict the use of natural resources. Uh, but within those limitations, there's probably um, room for growth, but perhaps not for ever more consumption uh, and, and consumption that, that leads to waste, etc. cetera. Um, so, well, I, I, I leave it uh, perhaps to Ralf Fuchs. I think he has a lot to say about that. <laughs> Ralf Fuchs, uh, I know uh, yeah, it's a long discussion, but very short, if you, if you could, we are My answer running. will be a little bit more, my answer will be a little, a little bit more radical. Um, <laughs> For, for me, this whole debate on, on degrowth is a flight from reality. Now, we are living in a world of growth. The world population will grow to probably 10 billion people uh, in, the, in the midst of our century. We have billions of people living on this planet who are striving for a higher living standard, for more education, better health care, better housing, and also for... Uh, all these kind of achievements of modernity we in, in Europe and in the uh, developing world are enjoying. So it's no prophecy at all to uh, predict that the world economy, the output of the world economy will, will, will double in the next 25 years. This is an annual growth rate of 3%. And this is why I'm insisting that the green industrial revolution decoupling economic prosperity from environmental degradation, from CO2 emissions, from pollution. Uh, this is uh, the most uh, crucial challenge we are facing for uh, the next decades. And this is the, the whole meaning of uh, going forward uh, to, to the, a green industrial revolution, reinventing mobility, uh, redesigning our, our industries, rebuilding our cities, uh, renewing our public infrastructure. And of course, this is not, I said this in my initial uh, statement, this is not against regulation. This is about smart regulation, but this is against the sense that 
the solution to the environmental crisis is that we have to restrict ourselves and to uh, make us smaller and uh, that, that this is a kind of revenge of nature for the sins of modernity. No, it's about the fossil economy. The fossil economy is uh, creating climate change. So we have to, to uh, depart from the, 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 the fossil economy to uh, an economy based on renewables, based on uh, synthetic fuels, based on, as it was already mentioned, a kind of zero waste uh, recycling than economy. And this is what my, 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 my whole thinking is about. How can we kick off? How can we create this big step forward, not backwards, forward to a new kind of, I would say, ecological modernity? And capitalism, you know, capitalism is a totally um, diverse system from Chinese state capitalism to Scandinavia to the, the US model. You can shape capitalism by political and cultural uh, the environment, yeah, by regulation. Uh, so it is not about abolishing capitalism. It is about uh, redirecting capitalism and the enormous productivity and innovative uh, power of the system into a sustainable direction. Yeah, that's a long and, and fascinating discussion because then somebody probably would add that it's not only about the climate, that we have many more problems and tensions as far as um, the surrounding is concerned. But there is another question. When um, the, the, the viewer writes, we as liberals, writes the viewer, sh can be talking about limiting um, our civic freedoms in the name of um, Green Deal. So when is, as I understand it, when is the moment that uh, liberals would feel restricted, that their freedoms are restricted or taken in the name of the Green Deal? I don't know, Tomasz Savczyk, when would you feel threatened? Well, um... I don't think I feel threatened. I would say that you cannot define uh, va values or things that you are for in the abstract. You always need to look at the concrete situation and then, set and, and, they, and then observe what can be done in this situation. So, for example, now we have this pandemic and people... So it's like practical liberalism. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Pe people, people live in, you know, people, want, people have to stay in flats in their houses all of the time, uh, many of them. And it differs if you live in a big house that have like 300 square meters or if you live in a one, uh, one room flat with your um, husband or wife and your children. And it is a very different kind of life if you have that kind of space. So I would say that uh, in a situation in which, in which you can always go to, to the other room, and uh, in which you can always distance yourself from other people. The question of what is freedom is a different question uh, compared to the world in which you live in a single room with other people and everything you do has an impact on them. So in such a, in such a flat, uh, you also can have freedom, but the question of how you should understand your freedom, I would say, is always to be put in a relation with other people. So, for example, you wouldn't say that freedom is to do anything that you want uh, unconstrained from the needs of others, but you would rather say that freedom is to collaboratively shape the relations with other people, that you can, that you can have a say in what is happening in that room. So I believe that we are transferring to a world in which we should understand freedom as having a say in what is happening, from the conception of a world in which we can do whatever we think is possible because uh, we think of, uh, of freedom unrelated to others. So it's like less dogmatism, more pragmatism. Yeah, absolutely. And more solidarity. Probably so, yes. Yeah, that's what I wanted the last word to Professor uh, uh, Nina Vitoshek, as you are over there in Norway and I have a Polish uh, background. And, and, and it seems to me that the, the whole discussion, and this is where the liberal will um, um, argue, is uh, that solidarity, uh, uh, liberalism needs more solidarity. 
Uh, I don't believe in solidarity. I'm sorry to be compromising the great Polish achievement. I believe in teamwork and cooperation and the solidarity, unfortunately, is tribal. It is us against them. Uh, teamwork, on the other hand, or cooperation, which I've learned from the Scandinavians, is something much more demanding, namely putting aside your particular interests, putting aside your uh, your uh, private egoism and trying to talk to the other party. And this is something that the Europeans have to learn. It's a very difficult art. It's an arcana. But uh, cooperation and teamwork beats solidarity uh, for breakfast, dinner and supper. And there's one more thing that I wanted to add to this discussion. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, um, first of all, uh, uh, I think we are a bit out of tact with what's going on in the world, because according to the 2019 US Energy and Employment Report, jobs in wind, solar energy, efficiency and other clean energy sectors outnumber already now fossil jobs or fossil jobs by a rate of three to one. The future lies in the renewable energy, in digitalization, robotization. And Mr. Kaczynski and Mr. Babich, who wants to send, who want to send their uh, grandsons and granddaughters to work in coal mines on the, in fossil energy, let them do that together with the Russians. But the jobs and the future belongs to the young generations who are embracing the renewables. These, these are the greatest paradoxes of today's liberalism, namely that Europeans are financing the losers. They are financing the fossil industry, which is the relic which belongs to the past. They sh instead of that, they should be financing the future renewable clean energies, which is the, <laughs> which is the future of the, of the young generations. And that's what we should look look after and uh, what, that's what we should care for. So uh, basically, even in, in, you know, in the most petrocolic, petrocolic country in Europe, in Norway, this is this kind of environmental and uh, market literacy has finally dawned on people. And uh, Norway, uh, you know, the oil uh, country, uh, uh, iconic oil country in Europe is going green big time because that's where the productive society and sustainable modernity lies. We have time because this is a very important moment to, to talk about what also Professor Timothy Gardner Ash mentioned, what would be the liberal cooperation, as Professor Vitoshek said, or solidarity between countries, especially the ones that are richer and poorer. It will be for another tense of discussions. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for your uh, insight. Uh, I, I guess this is, uh, we will be talking about it and talking, hopefully we will uh, manage to uh, find solutions before it's too late.